Hello, everybody. I would like to introduce a talk today about technological art of the trodden tracks. Uh, it's about artists misusing technology, and I honestly don't have any clue what it's about, but I'm very curious to see. May I introduce to you, you see Angus Leber and Regine de Batty. So I'm Regine de Batty and um, I've worked in media, I've done lots of st stuff in the past, but now I'm just a blogger. And uh, my blog is called We Make Money Not Art. Yeah, I started it one year and a half ago. And it talks about what artists are doing with technology and also design and other stuff, but mainly um, artists and technology. Yes, hello from my part as well. I'm Jussi Angesleva, as already kind of noted. Uh, I'm uh, living in Berlin, teaching at the university here, digital media, and working also at the same time uh, doing media arts related things. And uh, I guess to kind of frame a little bit of the talk for tonight, uh, um, kind of a word for why we are here in the first place, but we are basically here because Tim asked us to. The reason, the rationale behind why he did so, I don't know, but maybe the kind of uh, combination of um, Regine more kind of being very much aware of what is really going on in the field of media, media arts and me slightly being more involved maybe in doing uh, small projects myself in the field that we might be able to complement each other on the, on the talk. But we haven't talked this through yet, so we'll see what happens. So maybe I'll let you start. Yeah, well, maybe another reason why we are here uh, talking about artists is that there are many common points between, between hackers and digital artists. And yesterday I went to the introduction talk of, of Tim Pritlove and he gave um, a kind of definition and non-definition of, of hackers. And I saw that many of the points uh, he mentioned could be totally applied to new media artists. So I wrote my notes. And he said uh, that hackers are not criminal, that, that hacking is about freedom, understanding the world outside. And this world is, is filled with technology, more and more filled with technology. And if you want to understand the world, you, ha you have to understand this technology. He said that uh, hackers are people who like to go into the things and um, they don't want to be ignored, they have a voice. They are concerned about how the world is working and they would like to see it working in a better way. And we can really apply all these, all these sentences to, to artists. So there are many things in common between, between them and so many things that uh, I think that um, a, a hacker meeting uh, new media artists they, they could have a conversation, they, would, they could really talk. But if, if you have a new media artist meeting um, a contemporary artist, someone who's, who's painting or making sculpture, it's not, maybe they wouldn't have so much thing in common and so much point to discuss. But, so sometimes the boundaries are blurred between, between hacking and, and making digital art, but um, hackers and, and artists do not only have things in common, they also have, <laughs> Differences. Yeah, I mean, of course, and, and still have to say that we are now very much simplifying the equation, kind of coming up with some sort of stereotypes through which we then discuss a couple of projects later on. So here we have how ra hackers are related to media artists. Um, what Regina already said, I think I wrote this list separately from her, and, uh, but I think there's, there's a quite strong correlation. Now, in terms of what we felt that the, where the co correlations are not so strong is, uh, is basically in the methodologies of, of how to do things and, and, and also in terms of what to do with them. Uh, kind of as a one-liner, one could say that media arts in general is very often about providing a vision, you know, doing something that, that has some physical manifestation through whatever technological means that illustrates a point. It doesn't really work that well. And it's not replicable in a way that many hacker-style projects would be in terms of 
from ground up building up the community, coming up with the, the, the kind of whole space of possibilities what a given technology, a new idea could be applied to, reverse engineering things, coming up with new software libraries, etc. So all these things are, uh, so, so the perspective is much more, um, in a way, narrow uh, in terms of uh, having a kind of more people working on, on, on the same thing, but at the same time, uh, trying to just get the idea across that hopefully other people will then understand. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's in a way my, my kind of extremely narrow perspective on what the differences might be. I don't, did I miss something thus far? Can we sell the examples? Yep, I think um, the examples come, yeah. Yeah, to make it clear, uh, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. We just show a, a few examples, and we're not going to show everything that new media artists are doing uh, with technology. But as the theme of of the congress is private investigations, uh, we will we will just show several projects that explain how new media artists are, are dealing with surveillance technology, and um, with two. Uh, two themes in particular. I, I noticed in the, in the program that we'll be t we are talking here a lot about RFID and CCTV cameras, so we choose uh, several projects that, that deal with, um, with these technologies in particular. Um, yeah, that's normal. Okay, so this, this is the audio pad, so I will, I will just start with a few projects that talk about RFID or artists are using RFID. Of course, many artists are, are criticizing uh, RFID and, and organizing workshops where they, they explain uh, people who, who want to, who are not hackers, who are not artists and who are not technicians. Uh, they are explaining uh, the bad size of RFID. Also, they are showing them how to easily and cheaply make like a key holder that will uh, light when, the, when there's, a, there's an RFID reader in the neighborhood. One of them is, is quite famous for, for this, um, for this uh, workshop. It's called Zapt, and they are Americans. And sometimes they do things that really, they're quite st striking. Like a few months ago, they were in Houston. Uh, they were part of um, a big exhibition. And so they were showing some video. But for the opening of, of the show, they were, they were they were trying to demonstrate the, the nasty side of, of RFID, and they thought that the better way to, to do it, uh, not just to, uh, showing their, their video, but it was um, coming at the opening of the show with a series of small box, and inside each box there was a, box, there was a, a cockroach, uh, uh, the one from Madagascar, they are quite big, and they attached an RFID tag to, to each uh, cockroach, and they invited the people at, at the opening party to take a box with them and go, go to their uh, Walmart, uh, local Walmart supermarket, and just free the, the, the cockroach in the supermarket so that it would taint the database of the supermarket. But yeah, there are several projects like that. And uh, also, I, we wanted to show that some, some artists also see the good side of, of RFID because RFID is, is a, just a technology and it, in, in itself it's not, it's not bad, it's not nasty. So the first project is an uh, audio pad and um, it's, a, it's a musical table. And underneath the table, there, there are RFID readers. And so you just take uh, uh, small tokens, and with, uh, you move them on the table, and they are associated with sounds. And the movement you make um, uh, triggers some sounds, so you can use it as a musical instrument. Um, this one is um, by some German artists. Uh, there's, there's a series of bootleg, they call it bootleg projects. And their point is that we love, we love gadgets and we love shiny devices. And each time there's a new model, we just throw away the old one. But some of the old ones are, are still working perfectly and they, they look very, very nice. And so he, he, he has, uh, they had this record player and they, they just remove what was inside, and in, instead they, they put um, an RFID reader inside. So you just have the shape of a um, of, um, record player, but the technology is, is totally different. And each time, if you want to listen to, um, to some music, you take this old record sleeve, 
and uh, there's an RFID tag uh, attached to it, and you just put the, the sleeve uh, on, the, um, on the record player, and the music will, will go. I guess there the kind of underlying question is more to do with the, the sort of um, inbuilt uh, sort of redundance of modern technology so that they don't really, I mean, where's the Rolex of mobile phones? I mean, where's the thing that you would like to actually keep for 20, 30 years and that you still appreciate it as a form and you might kind of share it and change it? You use it for half a year, two years, and then you throw it away and get a nicer, newer, newer model that it's, it's not about how it, like, how it feels, but what it does. Yeah, here's a simple, a bit quirky project. It's called um, Junky Little Help Helper. It's a medicine cabinet, and uh, inside there are the bottles or the drugs, and they're associated with an RFID tag. And each time the person, and, and also the, the cabinet is networked with a chat room, each time the person is, is taking um, a bottle or, or some medicine, the people on the chat room are informed and, and also the, the, the cabinet start blinking and, and the people can phone the, the junkie and tell him, look, you're not supposed to, to take a drug again. So basically by making, making the, the community aware of the fact of the moment the person is uh, basically abusing drugs. Um, yeah, this, this one I, I found funny. Uh, this guy is, is an interaction designer and uh, he's also a VJ. And he thought it would be nice if a VJ, instead of uh, being uh, on his side of the nightclub behind his, his platform, if he could come and dance among the crowd. So there's a globe there and, and, um, at the bottom. Uh, there's an RFID reader and, and he put RFID tags on different parts of the body on different parts of the body. Um, and like, like there it would be reward. Uh, uh, if it's on the arm, it could be uh, switched to the, to the next uh, image and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's on. So what happened is that he's dancing among people and he's just doing this when, and this, this um, uh, controls the, the images, uh, the videos on the screen in the nightclub. Yeah, without music, it's a bit ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but with the music, it's worse, believe me. <laughs> oh, what do we have next? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But yeah, so all these projects thus far, they're more or less kind of um, neutral uses of RFID. I mean, they definitely have their own quirky undertone, but they're not really questioning the, the, the fact that we are being tracked by them uh, by doing shopping in a grocery store. Okay, so next one. Mm -hmm. um, this one is called uh, Peripheral Needs. Um, and it's for people with obsessive compulsive disorders. Like, uh, there are people who just um, get stressed and gets cold sweat if, if uh, they are in the bus or uh, in, the, in the train on their way to work and they suddenly think, oh, did I switch off the light and the oven and, and then they get cold sweat and they have to go back home be, to, to check if, if the electrical appliances are, are okay. So this system is that you have RFID on Velcro and uh, they are placed next to the electrical appliance on the, on the toaster or next to the oven. And so you, you, you take the Velcro, and on the Velcro it's written toaster or oven, and as you take it off, it just disempowers the, the, the electrical appliance, and you have a special bag, and you just put it on, on your bag. And so if, if you have problem and get nervous on the bus, you can just look at your, at your back and see, oh, uh, so light, okay, oven, okay. And there's also a pillow, so uh, if you have the problem in the night and you wake up because you're not <laughs> sure that you have uh, turned off the light, you can just um, look at your pillow and, and, and check. Yeah, now, um, yeah, what, what we noticed with RFID is that uh, we had projects which were criticizing the technology, projects which were not neutral, projects which used RFID in a, in a way to, to enhance the, la the life of people. We had um, 
much more pro problems uh, finding projects which would say, oh, CCTV cameras are great and uh, surveillance must be increased. So we, 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 I'm sorry, we only have a series of projects which uh, show surveillance in a, in a dark light. Um, this, this game is a game about airport insecurity. It's for mobile phones. It's, it's, um, it's been released in November, I think. And it's, been totally, it's totally based on the, on the rules of um, airport security since uh, 2002. So um, it's best played while, while you are queuing uh, before, before being screened at the, at the, at the airport. So you, you encounter uh, people from the security. They are self-important. They are not nice. But uh, every three miles, they have, there's a corporate coffee machine to, to help you uh, support the, the long wait at the, at the airport. And also it questions um, the fact that uh, we are told that um, we have to increase this, um, this technology of surveillance, that we have to give up rights. And, uh, because it's for our security, it's against terrorism, but these, um, these, um, these security procedures at, at airport are not 100% uh, efficient anyway. Then there's a series of, of projects which criticize um, uh, the homeland security uh, threat level. It's, um, it's a system in, in the US which gives uh, colors according to today. It's, uh, it's a very dangerous there. There's a high level of, of threat, a high level of um, possibility to be attacked by terrorists. Uh, so you, you check it, you can check it every, every day to get even more nervous, I don't know. And um, so some artists have, have decided to work on that, like this one, he, he has made a vest. So this vest can keep you warm in case of a terrorist attack. But it's, it's also networked, so if, if you are in a, in a Wi-Fi environment, uh, the level of threat, of threat on, the, on, the, on the jacket will, will be lighted. And there are others like that, that. There's also a blanket which will get warmer if the, if the, the threat is, is higher because it will comfort you more. Um, also, Jonah Brecker Cohen made something, I think, very interesting. This um, Homeland Security um, uh, system is made uh, internally and probably a bit arbitrarily. And he made a um, Homeland Insecurity Advisory System, which uh, instead of um, warning people about uh, the threat, the threat uh, by terrorists, warn, warn people about the threat by, uh, posed by the US government itself. Um, uh, this is a project I really like. Um, it's the Insecurity Camera. It's a high-tech um, video surveillance camera. It has uh, um, artificial intelligence algorithm, um, quite advanced uh, computer vision system, and it can zoom and track people that, that come in its field of view. But this particular camera, it's a bit insecure. It's a bit shy. Uh, it doesn't like to, to watch if people, is, uh, people are watching uh, and raising their eyes towards the, the, the is, is there a video? OK, there's a video. Uh, towards the, the camera, the camera will, will turn away. Also, it, it's frightened, frightened when there's a sudden noise. <laughs> is it OK? Am I not talking? No, it's, it's very good. <laughs> So it's totally a kind of reversal of the, the, the habitual situation. And it, there's a kind of relationship between, between the, the, the surveillance camera and, and the people passing. And yeah, I feel quite sorry for the camera. <laughs> um, this one is a, is a kit. Um, and with the kit, you have a um, mobile phone jammer and also a tape. And on the tape, it's a, it's a yellow. Maybe there's a better picture here. 
No, there's not a better picture. Yes, it's yellow and black, like on on crime scenes, and you you put it on it's a, on on the the place you have selected, and you put the mobile phone jammer, and uh, and there's no 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 signal of of mobile phone, but. You see, as a more interesting <laughs> anecdote. From that. Well, I mean, I get, I, I, well, Pedro Sepulveda, who's, who's worked on this project, whose project it is, is looking in general at the, the kind of um, digital technologies, aesthetics, how they can affect architecture. He's an architect by training. And this is, in a way, is one example of that, say, I mean, in today's world, any elect electronic networks, wireless networks, etc., are always kind of built on top of the ex existing architecture. So he's kind of questioning or looking at how those things might actually begin to manifest themselves in the reality if they were designed from ground up. So this, this is kind of a very hacker way of doing this, just having the, the masking tape that then relates to the nearby mobile phone jammer. Of course, it's not in the right dimension or proportion, but using the using the, uh, this as, as an indicator of the area. Now, this again is very much, you can see this is a kind of a comment on the, on the fact that there's this, all this invisible, um, in this case, electromagnetic magnetic radiation that is uh, kind of, uh, without our permission, uh, infiltrating everywhere. Uh, and, and that is, I mean, as Rajin was saying earlier on, this is exactly most of the projects that are, have this kind of a tone. And another project that Pedro did before was looking at uh, ways people could avoid being in front of a CCTV camera when moving around in a public space. He did, his, he did a good number of studies and uh, uh, talked with people, interviewed them about how they feel about being in, in CCTV cameras. And um, in a way, the statement of by providing a, uh, like different ways of like war charking style, but, uh, but the, the CCTV fields of view, etc. There's different projects that do lots of that kind of stuff. Uh, the statement normally there is that you should have the freedom to choose not to be in the camera. But the, by, by, the, by the area where he did, did he conduct his studies was uh, in Hackney in London. Most of the people he talked with were very happy with the fact that there were CCTV cameras looking at them. Of course, then for them, it was more like a, this line would tell them, yes, I can be in the, in the beam versus I can be out of the beam. So this is kind of very kind of ambivalent or this kind of two-sided two equation normally with, the, with this kind of security camera or security technology related projects. I think the next project would be exactly yeah. about that. Yeah, so the next project is a bit similar to what uh, UC has been just explained. It's called IC and um, it just maps uh, the localization of the, CC, the CCTV cameras. So let's say you, want, you don't like to be, to be on, on this camera and you go from point A to point B, you go on the website of IC and it will show you the, the best way, which is not the straighter way, uh, where you, you can reach point B without being or being as less as possible in the field of uh, CCTV camera. And they made also a version for PDA from when you're not home. Um, yeah, this is a project I, I really like. Uh, it's called Troya for Temporary Residency of Intelligent Agent. Uh, it's a mobile and, and really huge stage. And inside they show uh, interaction um, projects, whatever. And they go from, from city to city. But what's interesting is that um, they have, um, like performance, uh, perform performance people, uh, people who are undercover and who are uh, intellectual, uh, intelligent agents. And their mission is to to stay undercover, they cannot be detected as, as actors, but uh, they have to, to trigger conversation, to, to mingle with the, with the crowd, to talk with people, and to, to infuse ideas and opinions about uh, surveillance and how in Europe, more and more, we are, we are these um, uh, um, surveillance control, these technology of control are taking ground in, in Europe, and, and really trying to, to um, to talk with people and have conversation with them and, and the hope is that once the stage uh, is going to another city, uh, people will, will um, remind this co conversation, they will go home and talk about it maybe with their family and it's, 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 uh, I think it's quite a clever way to, uh, 
to let people know about it and to, to raise the awareness. Yeah, many projects. Um, this one is Life's uh, user manual, and uh, it's, it's a woman, it's Michelle Terran, and she goes, she walks in the street. She's dressed as a homeless person, and she, she's got a cart, and there uh, are rugs on the cart and discarded objects, but underneath, uh, she's got a co mobile computer system that just snatches the, um, the um, surveillance camera broadcast, and uh, show them on the on TV screen, uh, which are on the side of the cart, so everybody can see exactly what these uh, surveillance cameras are, are shooting. <laughs> um, this one is called a random search, and it's, it's just a garment uh, with um, pressure sensors, and it's um, it's just a concept product. It works, but uh, she's not selling it, of course. Um, yeah, it's, it's when you, you go to airport or to concert or sport events, you are searched and, and security personnel are touching you. And here, each time someone is touching you for, for security reason, uh, with, with the metal detector, uh, it triggers some light so you can share with, with the people around you uh, what you are in, intimately nearly uh, experiencing during, during the search. So it makes it even more uh, visible. Yeah, this one is okay. Um, that's a funny one. It's the, the corporate fallout detector, and it's something. Um, it's not too heavy, but you can take it to the supermarket, and it scans. It, it scans barcodes, and according to the there's a huge database behind it, of course, and uh, according to the to the ethic and the respect to the that the, the manufacturer of the product as for the environment, it will make um, more and more noise. So if, if you buy a can of, uh, of beans and the manufacturer is, uh, doesn't have a good behavior, doesn't respect environment and doesn't have um, very good ethics, it will make really a lot of noise. And as, and as probably, yeah, as, as most of you probably have one of those original devices at home, you notice them as, notice the, repurposed uh, Geiger meter as the, as the source. Yeah, it kind of highlights the notion of danger. This is a, a headscarf. Uh, it's called Tika. It's, uh, the, the design is uh, inspired by uh, what Muslims are, are wearing. And uh, so it's, it's a way to draw attention to the fact that uh, after 2001, there was, there were, um, a systematical, um, uh, they were checking, oh, how can I say, uh, systematical profiling of um, Arab citizens or Ar Arab looking citizens. So um, there's something here on the, on the shoulder, on the left shoulder, and uh, if you press the, the button, it will um, uh, show a beam, um, a beam of light and uh, the, the surveillance camera we we'll, won't detect your face exactly, we'll just see a beam of light. And also the, the clothes is reflective to protect your, your face again. And it's, it's quite, um, how can I say, um, on the one hand it's, it just uh, asks for increased surveillance because the, the person who wears it, it just screams, oh she's, a, she's an, someone from, from Islam because she, she's got that, that, that head scarf. And uh, on the other hand it protects you, so it just highlights the, the discrimination. Okay, your turn. Okay, very good. So now we go about faking it. Um, so what I so in the beginning I was saying about the the way media artists have often a way of trying to get their points across with whatever, whatever means possible. Sometimes it. It, it results in fully functional things, other times it doesn't. And in a way, my question perhaps to you today is very much about, so which way is the more appropriate? Is it okay to fake things? And if so, how should you do it the best way? So I'll show you four projects that kind of relate to the, to the subject. So the first one um, is a project by Georg Tremel and Chiho Fukuhara called BioPresence. Uh, the idea is very simple. Uh, most of our DNA, or most of the DNA in most of living things, is junk. 
and their question was that what could you do with if it's junk you can throw it away what can you put there instead and their result was this uh, living uh, kind of a memorial a living monument like living tombstone sort of a thing so taking the active parts of your loved one's uh, DNA and implanting into a junk DNA part of a tree and then you plant it somewhere in the graveyard wherever you want to plant it so it completely changes the the perception even though functionally it doesn't do anything about them so so this is a this is completely a concept so what they, what what they did about the project was that they went to talk with a number of different scientists about the feasibility in the first place and what they would need to to go about doing it and the the, re, the response was resounding yes that there's no problem in principle about doing this of course it would need some good backing to to get it commercially done or like get it done in the first place and um, up with this information at the background what they did to present the work to to craft the work was that they wrote a press release describing the project and send it to many newspapers in UK. And as a result, they got a huge, completely controversial or like, like bipolar uh, response, people who wanted to kill them and people who wanted to be stored once they were killed or dead uh, through their means. And, and this whole discourse, I th for me, in the beginning, I felt that it was really, you know, a, like a cheat or kind of a cop out of a project. I mean, this one one liner, an idea. They didn't do anything about it. They just talked to some people and then presented some clippings and, uh, you know, newspaper clippings and, and people's letters about them. But in terms of what they wanted to do with the project, by proposing this idea and, and qu making pe people question about that side of biotech, I think it, in retrospect it was hugely, su hugely successful. Can't think of any but better way of doing it. Uh, the next project, this is from maybe 2002 by uh, Jimmy Loiseau and James Auger, called Audio Tooth. Uh, basically a Bluetooth audio implant in your tooth, using bone conductance to uh, to make the sound audible and then having a microphone so that uh, that's, that it would also uh, broadcast the signal. So I mean, Bluetooth, tooth. Uh, so what they did, this is, this is all they did. Again, I mean, for me, I was very critical when I saw this first time. I mean, nice idea. Okay, so what's, what's coming out of it? So they did this huge tooth. I mean, it's about this big and put some any old uh, microcontroller single board, I don't even know what it's in there, and cast the whole thing in resin. Looks great, and it's a great tool for talking. Uh, then they also did their research and talked to lots of people about the feasibility of if this would be possible to do. And again, the, the, the response was re resounding yes, that's given a couple of years, miniaturization, all that, yes, it would be possible to do. Um, and again, they got uh, equally controversial or kind of bipolar response from the audience saying how, how, how this kind of, um, uh, what do you call it when, uh, when technology gets implanted in human body? Bio, well, no, no, it's uh, cyborg, yes, thanks very much. Um, this kind of cyborg discourse in the first place and then people who just felt it, it'd be a very use, useful thing to have. Um, then another project, this one is from, um, from the University of Arts, where I'm teaching, uh, a project called Parasites. Uh, the idea was looking at uh, trains as interfaces. And what the, what the guys did, they um, um, made this uh, little kit that you could plug on the side of the train and it would project uh, parallel worlds into the by-flying buildings basically, using camera tracking to match the speed and people looking out through the window, they would see these parallel words being, being kind of whizzing by. Uh, so what they did was that they did a fully functional demo, but from within the train, so having a normal projector and laptop in their lap and projecting through the window, and then made a beautiful looking case with the right kind of fittings that you could actually mount in the wall. And these two things were separate. They were presented as one thing, and they, they again got very, very nice response for the project. There's the kind of, uh, so, so for me, there's the kind of um, the real, the question there is that in order to make impact, you have to be standing behind the idea. You have to be very strong about it and kind of visionary. 
but at the same time uh, when this becomes lying when this becomes like too much that people then like I want to have this in my so-and-so next thing and where, where can I buy it? And then if you say that, well, you know, it's not really working, then what happens? I mean, this has happened to me also a couple of times, and it's always a kind of interesting experience to how to deal with those situations. Um, yes, then the next project uh, is kind of a combination of many things. This is a project that I did back in the day together with Markus Kirsch. Started in London at the Royal College working on this thing as a result of a brief looking at um, um, wearable technology. So we extended wearable technology to both extremes, the implant-like things and then the easy removable like wristbands and clothes, etc. Uh, and then tried to find something in between. Uh, ended up looking at edible technology, tried to feed, edible, uh, tried to feed uh, things to people. Nobody wanted to eat them, therefore I decided to feed them to pigeons. Um, at the same time, what was happening in UK, this was kind of this whole Data Protection Act thing going about where it became legal, legally uh, binding for companies having public space CCTV cameras to provide uh, the material of those, if they're recorded, to pro provide the material to those who would request who would have been in the pictures themselves. So if you're standing in front of the CCTV camera, you could go to the company the next day and say, hey, I was there between five, uh, five and seven. Uh, could I please have the videotape where I was standing there? Uh, and they would be legally bound to actually providing you with, I mean, but then you would have to pay some money for the processing. But in, in principle, it became legal. So. We're looking at this whole development and did some bit of uh, kind of leap of faith there and proposed a combination of these two things. Both of us were living in London at the time, not knowing the city, um, and were interested in kind of browsing around in, in, in the uh, unknown areas. And uh, ended up proposing this project called Urban Eyes, where we would feed uh, pigeons with RFID uh, transponders. And the CCTV cameras in the public space, if, if, if people started requesting the material, maybe one day they would be networked. Maybe the, the, the streams could be then tapped and automated. And then maybe some people would also install some RFID readers to those cameras and then, you know, that when the, the birds would fly by, you would capture those images and they would be sent to you. Of course not. Uh, this was an idea, it was uh, like, it was just combining these, these various di different things into this one big scenario, looking at giving a bird's eye perspective to a passerby who would then lead you through the city uh, into unknown situations and kind of unexpected corners through camera visions that weren't meant for the public consumption. So then, okay, so this was the, the big idea, never meant to be done. And then we got some little funding to actually make it. So we had to start chopping off the edges of our big vision, the vision that we knew that wouldn't really happen, even though we were kind of standing behind it. So what we then did uh, was this uh, little bird feeding station. Uh, it's a little platform with the RFID reader inside. Uh, and then we manually searched through different web, uh, web streams in, in the area. This is in Rotterdam, in Holland. Um, that we would then manually connect to be sent through this device to people with mobile phones close by when birds with uh, RFID chips on their legs instead of feeding them would land on that thing. So, okay, this is an extremely condensed description of the project, but basically we started chopping the edges off from all sides and making it smaller and smaller in order to, for us to be able to make it. At the same time, it still, for me, kind of maintains kind of the essence, but is it really the same project, I would like to ask you. So, wh like, whether it was better to fake it or to make it, in this case, where the concept was at the level that it wasn't really feasible in the first place. Right. Uh, so, I guess it's time to kind of wrap things up and look at uh, what, we, uh, what, we, what we've kind of gone through here. This is a bit of a tangent to the, to the wrapping up of things. Um, we're just, look, we're just, just uh, maybe half an hour ago, about so, we were talking about other kind of new tendency in the media arts that we felt very similar to the kind of community spirit in the hacker. Uh, 
scene, which was this kind of sharing of ideas and, and organizing smaller scale workshops and be, like building these communities around things. So here we have uh, uh, different hacking workshops, little electronics for, uh, for designers and artists, just as inspiration for, for how to go about uh, coming up with new, new ideas with tools that you don't really know that well about. Um, yeah. Yeah, but something about what new media artists could bring to hmm. chaos. Yeah, so, um, so the, the kind of question, on one hand, the question that I just laid it to you was that which way for the media arts is better to work, whether it's about uh, doing scenarios or doing real things. The other question for us is to then, like, well, this being the case, how would you feel about, uh, wh how would you see the, uh, the role of, of media arts in the kind of work you're doing? What is the value added of, of this kind of quirky projects that may look nice and work and provide some kind of inspiration and new way of thinking about things to, to, your, to your domain? And one kind of um, way that we were thinking about it would be to say that, well, as I was showing those quirky fake projects, they got lots of exposures to people who didn't really look for this stuff. So the way I feel about the hacker community is that once you want to know, there's lots of people working on the area who want to share ideas and who, once you put yourself into the situation, it's really, really, um, you know, you can learn a lot and you can give a lot. At the same time, people who don't know about things, who are kind of outside, who you might need to, you, you might want to draw into the equation. Uh, what, what I feel about many of these kind of media artsy projects are that they catch people's inspiration and, and, and the kind of excitement through tangible examples that they can deal with and understand without understanding the technology are much easier. Therefore, trying to find a way where these two things could exist in balance or support each other could be maybe an interesting new tangent. Okay. No? Yeah. Very good. So, yeah. I guess we leave it for the questions. Hi, um, I have a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for the really good examples of media art and its application. I think uh, er a place like this really needs that type of exposure for the people because most of us are programmers, hackers, we don't really know what's going on in the, in the media arts field. Um, I agree with a, lot, with, a, with, with a lot of what you're saying, both of you are saying, but I think you're really missing the point and the punctum and you're kind of missing the mark at why you, you're showing this to the people here in particular. And I think um, the thing that makes media artists, computer artists, and hackers um, one community is the fact that, uh, quite frankly, both groups like to fuck around. Pardon my French. The whole point is that um, both groups are remediating. They're pushing the boundaries of what we perceive technology to be. And I think that that's more important than saying that these that's people are true. playing around with media arts. It's, it's actually we are at the forefront, at the cutting edge of what we can do with technology. And both this, this is what's synonymous in both groups. And I think that's really what you're missing. Now, we... <laughs> We, we were meaning to communicate it and we didn't <laughs> communicate it well. We just, that's what we meant to say. So thank you. Thanks for the articulation. Yeah, thanks for the articulation. <laughs> Actually, um, I, I have a couple of points. I hope I don't forget them. Uh, my point was kind of similar because um, I, I, I wouldn't have uh, said that you uh, didn't get uh, this across. I think you got it across very, uh, very well uh, that um, I don't think uh, the, uh, the question is, are uh, artists allowed to lie? I think uh, lying is, is very well a uh, means to, to an end sometimes. And this is uh, good for, uh, this, uh, this uh, is, is true for the artist as well as the hacker. And um, so to answer your question from, from my position, of course it, it is okay to lie and to fake it. 
Um, on the other thing, uh, on the other hand, what uh, kind of struck me was um, that the being an artist allows you to have a freedom in designing your things uh, that you don't have when you're working for money. Um, because uh, what what you showed tonight was uh, were many things that uh, were like they were like products. What these artists are, are basically product designers, but they are much more free in what they create because they are not restricted by what uh, is practically um, doable today. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this also counts to the point that uh, of course it's it's uh, okay to lie. Mm -mm. Absolutely, and, and this was what I was saying in the beginning, the idea that how I feel about the media artist role in, in providing a vision and kind of sort of a scaffolding that shows the way without solving all the problems yet. That it would be kind of way of seeing the world rather than the, 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 the manual how to get there. Um, well, since you were asking for an answer I was waiting. to your question. Hello. Um, hey. So. <laughs> Please. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I think. Oh, just before I'll be, I'll, I'll try to be short, as short as possible. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I will add quite similar thing like you with your great French mentioned, is. Um, that it's it's great to 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 see the aesthetization of the really important and political issues. It's it's quite uh, great to see the uh, how people um, how people deal with that at the symbolic level. But I, I would just like to add that uh, that the great possibility, great opportunity is in playing with the identity of artist. Where if you just pick it up, if you articulate something as an art piece has much more freedom for you and, and there is some big protection where you can fight for quite serious political issues. And I think that hackers in that sense are uh, very se sensitive about that and they are, they are in, uh, in the fight for quite serious political issues and what I propose in that sense is uh, to go through that as an artist and not just saying I'm an artist, there is really big uh, a need to actually to have uh, hackers then with the his, historians so far or whatever, who, whoever is good in theory, to make it more than just banal reference. But I think that that's the way how, how some really serious issues could be addressed. Thanks. And I just wanted to say, if you build it, and after you've built it, you still have to explain it, then you shouldn't have built it in the first place, but left it with the explanation. And uh, unfortunately, I think my observation is that for most of media art, as far as I've seen it so far, um, these explanations are, if not necessary, at least they are provided. <laughs> so, yes. And so therefore, I think most of media art should have just uh, be <laughs> left conceptual. <laughs> Yes, I, I, that's, that's a view. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I could refer. To, I mean, this was a uh, impromptu um, uh, experiment that, I, yeah, last time in Heidelberg in the talk, I, somebody was asking a little bit of the sim similar thing about the definition of media arts or something related, and then I coined a quick test to look at the the feasible or the or the or the utility of something like that, and it was to say that. You take the inputs out, replace them with random, and then if it still feels the same, then you might be off the mark. Um, hello. Uh, yeah. So, say something on that. Also, just the one thing you you showed that didn't really ring true in that respect was the uh, the woman with the Muslim style thing. In that, like, I can understand the context. I, I know what airport security is like. I know what the current situation is in the world, yet I didn't understand it looking at it, and I didn't even understand it until kind of you explained, you know, it's, it's a contradiction between wanting, you know, attracting attention and rejecting it. It wasn't immediately obvious. I mean, I think that kind of fails in that way. But yet, if I didn't know anything about the, 
Muslim world or anything, some explanation would be useful um, in that respect. Uh, but in, in terms of your, your question, whether it's okay to be to kind of deceive the audience, maybe um, I, I think it, it, the answer is it depends, and it depends how you're deceiving the audience. Um, you know, at a certain point, you, you, you're not writing science fiction, and I, I don't think that'd be your intent. A lot of science fiction says, well, what if reality was the same, but this one little thing was different? How would that change our world? And so, th but that doesn't seem like what you're doing. It's saying like, this is reality. This is what could be in, in five years, in 10 years. Um, but when, if you start making up technology, or if you're not sure that the technology can actually do what you're pretending it can do, then you're, you're really doing a disservice to your audience. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> could I, could I take it? I'm not sure if you, if you answer this or not. I, I'd just like to make a brief comment. Is, is this like audible? Okay, so it's a very, very brief comment. So what I think is very cool like um, in, this, in, in this whole media art thing is that you like take out the art out of the galleries and into the public spaces, like for example with this Berlin thing, with, with, with this U-Bahn and like I'm often at the Alexanderplatz here in, in the U-Bahn station, like the U2, and there's always this art in public space and I think that's really cool because of like everybody can experience it and, and you have a few spare minutes and can experience the art and then, yeah. That's, that's I, think, I, th I think it's one of the strengths of, of new media art, at least of some piece. If you, if you take children to a museum, they will just look at paintings, they, they might like it. But um, I, I've, I'm always amazed like when I go to the, some media art festivals and I see people coming with their children and children, some of the, the, the things they saw they don't like, but many, very often I see them having fun and wanting to, wanting to interact. I, I have the feeling that because of that interaction part, um, new media art is a, is a strength um, that traditional art doesn't have, that like, people have the feeling that they can, they can touch it and, and contribute. And they feel more involved. Well, yeah. And it's very cool. Maybe. We, okay, I guess we're kind of out of time, are we? No, not really. No? But yes. One more. Okay. Um, one, more. one more comment. Uh, I'd like to thank you and say, I've, uh, from my point of view, this uh, hacker perspective is somewhat sharing tools. And the nice thing about the tool is to use the tool. As long as you're just uh, sharing your ideas, from, from my perspective, it's, uh, it's nice if you, if you get the idea communicated and people get the point. If it's actually usable, that's not the point, because it's not a tool. You're, 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 you're communicating, and that's yeah, yeah. the important part of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, communicating the existence of a tool without having access is causing envy and not uh, joy. Um, hmm. no. um, um, uh, sorry. As long as I'm not... Uh, wanting to obtain your artwork. I like to hear about it and it's okay. If I hear about a tool, I like to obtain it, I like to use it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I think is special about new media art is that it's uh, a form of art that is critical with the work, uh, with the stuff it works with. And at the same time, the stuff it works with, the materials, are the same as the materials hackers have. So that's, that's the basic link about, about it. And then a new media art has, has the strength to communicate um, the, the problems and the, the criticism with technology in a, in a way that hackers mostly don't have. Um, I think that, that's, a way, that's, a, that's a connection or that, that's a, a strength where, where media art can, can enhance the, the political views and the, right. the, the issues um, hackers have with, with, with certain technological aspects or that, that may, gives us or gives, gives, gives uh, the community other possibilities. I think that could actually be enhanced some more as well. So, um, yeah, well, work together. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's okay. It. That's it. Thank you very much.